are you? I hope you're all well and doing okay in this wintry weather. Some people like it, some people don't. I'm an I don't. Well, I don't mind, but it's the way, oh, I get aches and pains, you know, come to that time. I've always got aches and pains in this weather though. I can't say it's because I'm older. It's just because I'm me, but oh, hot baths and my my father-in-law used to say, would you like a rub down with a wet lettuce? And we all, yeah, I would fancy a rub down. But uh, due to the, uh, you know, situation, I'm not going for my usual massages. I'm not going to the gym because, you know, I'm keeping myself safe at the moment. And uh, that's what I feel is best for me. So I'm missing out on that, really. So I'm having to be quite strict with myself and do my exercises. Anyway, you surely wanted to know all of that, didn't you? Oh, my name's Penny and I live in the southeast of England with my husband Pete and my four chickens. And what's on the agenda today? Okay, we've got a fascinating fact. We've got a little chat with Pete and me. We went out for a walk. It was a lovely walk. I didn't have any aches and pains that day. And we plopped ourselves down with a drink and we had a little chat about schooling. Uh, <laughs> it's funny what comes up, isn't it? Anyway, so we share that. And what else? Oh, oh, I know. A little bit of TA, transactional analysis, counselling, because oh, some people are really enjoying it. If you don't like it, I put stamps along the bottom so you can fast forward. And we're on stroking this week. And that sort of got me thinking about what Pete and I talk about school. So there's that. And there's a little film which I'll explain before, and that's at the end. I want to show you something I've been making this week. I haven't done much knitting because my hands have been hurting. I finished the sock that I was doing last week and I've got a little bit on. That's my second one. So we're getting there. But you know, I can't spend hours and hours doing it. But there it is, there's the first one. So when they're all washed and they're a pair, I'll show you. However, do you remember I made this project bag last week because I sent off for the fabric and I love it. I love the bag. I love everything about it. So I'm hooked on project bags. So I thought, okay, the person who gave the pattern on YouTube for this one, is, well, she's given a lot of patterns. So I made another one. Well, what happened was um, Lois popped round and Lois popped round, she said, oh, Nan, she said, that would be lovely to keep nappies in and pseudocream. I said, oh, would you like me to make you one? Oh, yes, please. So I made her one. And she liked this. This is called, oh, what's this called? I made my brother a quilt last year um, and I used the fabrics. Oh, I think it's called Winter in Wonderland or something like that. Yeah, I'll put it down below. I'm no good at remembering. Anyway, she loved it. So I made her this. Um, what's inside? Oh, yes, it's the same. And I did a little, can you see? A little pretty round the edge. And, yes, yeah, she wants to keep the nappers in it. I think that's a great idea, don't you? So that's that. I did that. Because when my hands hurt, I can use my machine, you see. So uh, that's what I've been doing this week. But then I thought, oh, I liked the pocket on here. This one was without a pocket. But she does one. I'll put, I'll put the pattern link below with a pocket. So I thought, all right, I'll try that. And then I remembered my friend Kay actually bought some fabric for Lois. She said you might be able to use it for her. So I made this one. I did uh, that on the machine. Usually I'd hand quilt it, but as I say, on the machine down there, I think it looks all right, doesn't it? Nice pocket. She brought me the two fabrics, so I used the two fabrics inside. 
And this one, instead of having the lines going through the actual top, going through the project bag, this has got a little bit that you sew on the top. So it's separate, but it's also got this as well. I thought that would be handy, and it looks lovely, doesn't it? Eating too much lettuce makes me sleepy. Perhaps a rub down with a wet lettuce would make me sleepy. <laughs> but it's so cute. So that was, oh, and I got a little rabbit ribbon. There it is. So that was that. Then, of course, I saw another. I thought, well, I was going to, what do they call it? You know, I've got a big stash. I mean, I've been quilting and sewing, well, making quilts. I've been making quilts for, I don't know, 24 years. So I've got a lot of stash. And I was just getting to the point where I thought I'm not going to be making any more big quilts anymore. I think I'll get rid of some of my stash. Well, project bags, I think I can use my stash, which will be jolly good. So my daughter, uh, other daughter, Kim, she bought me um, last year for my anniversary. She bought me a little group of fabrics, uh, which I'll put in the link below because I haven't written it down and I've forgotten. And uh, so it was another project bag. And they said, she said it's a little bit bigger because the top bit is separate, but it's much bigger. Can you see that, that bit at the top? Yeah, it's pretty, isn't it? And then two and a half inch squares, you make that bit. And I, oh, I quilted on the machine. This is quite new for me. I'm not a quilter on the machine, but it's worked out well. And then another box bottom, so it stands up nicely when it's full, and you can get more in there. It's lovely. I absolutely thrilled to flipping bits with it. I like that one. I like the top. I mean, you don't have to do those. You could just do one piece of fabric. I like the two. Oh, there's so many. And the next one I'm going to try, she says you need thicker fabric for the top because it sort of folds in and it goes in like that you need a bit thicker fabric to hold the shape um and i've got i've got plenty of that that i've bought from ali pali and the places that i've been to so in that whereas before i was thinking oh what shall i do with it now i'm gonna make it's gonna be my thing isn't it making project back <laughs> so there we are i like that one too it's a bit bigger and I like the way that this has got a nice bit of room for the cord. Hobbycraft didn't have any of the cord, you know, because I noticed people put cord in it. But again, I, I got some pretty ribbon. And on the way out, as I passed the way out, I had like five metres of ribbon for a pound. And the normal price for this is... Um, I think it's it's a pound a metre, something like that. Anyway, so that's what I've been up to, craft-wise. I'll just have a slurp of tea and I'll be back. And so, what's next? Well, should we do the fascinating fact? If you're new here, uh, I generally talk about crafting at the beginning and then I talk about a fascinating fact about nature. Um, We've, we're becoming very aware of it all, aren't we? And what I like is the bit where nature and science goes together. Uh, because, yeah, nature is really helping science in lots of different ways. So I'll make up a little, just a little bit about uh, an animal or a bird or, yeah, butterflies I've done. All different, whatever, whatever takes my fancy. And this week it's about a lizard yeah, a lizard, and how it's helping um, researchers who want to make robots for if there's a disaster. They want to make them that, that, that they can really, you know, get into those places and be very, can you get what I mean by this? Be very flexible. 
So that's what I've done. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I'll see you in a minute then. The agama jumps from a horizontal surface onto a vertical wall with ease. But if that surface is slippery, the lizard loses its footing, yet it still makes a successful landing on the wall. How? The secret is in the lizard's tail. When agamas jump from a coarse surface, which provides grip, they first stabilise their body and keep their tail downward. This helps them to jump at the correct angle. When on a slippery surface though, the lizards tend to stumble and jump at the wrong angle. However, in midair, they correct the angle of their body by flicking their tail upward. The process is intricate. Lizards must actively adjust the angle of their tails just right to remain upright, says a report released by the University of California, Berkeley. The more slippery the platform, the more the lizard must raise its tail to ensure a safe landing. The Agama's tail may help engineers design more agile robotic vehicles that can be used to search for survivors in the aftermath of an earthquake or other catastrophe. Robots are not nearly as agile as animals, says researcher Thomas Libby, so anything that can make a robot more stable is an advancement. Well, there we are. Flexible is one word, isn't it? And agile. So now we're going to have a chat. Pete and I, as I say, we had a chat after our walk and it's about him going to college and about how I felt about school and about self-doubts. So I'll have a chat with you after that. So we're all in blue. It's just a coincidence. Uh, we've been out uh, for a few bits and we come back having a drink and so we thought we'd pop on because we were just talking about our schooling. And I said I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. And, you know, when I left school, and my dad said to me, I remember, you know how you remember things in your life, plain as day. And he said to me, Pen, whatever you want to do, I will back you up and you can do it. I will support you. And I remember standing there thinking, but what is there to do? I didn't know about life. I didn't know what there was. Not like now, everybody knows everything. All I knew is I got up in the morning, went to school and came home. I didn't think any further than that. <laughs> However, looking back, I did know what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a teacher. But my teachers said, I went to a private school and it was quite, you know, got to achieve and all of that and they all they said to you was if you don't do better you won't get on if you don't do better and I thought well I can't do any better so I thought well there's no chance of me ever being a teacher and so I believed them when I look at my mum she saved my school reports and I look and I think I could have been a teacher of course I could no self-doubt and if any of you watch the counselling bit adapted child I believed the teachers Whereas Pete's completely the different, aren't you? Yeah. Completely the different, Complete completely opposite. different opposite. Uh, I went to a comprehensive school. I mean, it was it was a, quite an, uh, it was early for comprehensive, and it was built for the comprehensive system. So it was a brand oh, almost a brand new school, and they had different blocks, and and they had a domestic science block and a science block and a this that and the other block and two gyms. But it, and I think that because it had the domestic science block and with, big, with kitchens and all that, I just fancied, yeah, fancy doing that. that. Yeah. And and so this was nineteen fifty eight. You're talking about, mm. and you went along then for your first class domestic oh, science. Oh yeah, I asked if I could do it. This was in the third year. Right. Now, I asked if I could do cooking, and they said yeah. So. I turned up on the first day of term and I went to the cooking place and I went in and said, and the first thing this teacher said to me was, where's your apron? And I said, I haven't got one. I never knew you had to have an apron. I mean, I said, you can't stay in my class without an apron. And if you've forgotten your apron, I don't want you in my class at all. She chucked me out and I'd go back to woodwork and all the rest of it, which I didn't mind. 
I did mind. I wasn't doing it. I didn't mind the woodwork. But if it had been maths, I would have minded. Um, so I, I wasn't allowed to do it for a year. But I still carried on wanting to do it. So the following year, the following, it was the following year, I was in the fourth year, the Miss whatever her name was, Hodge, one of the old school teachers, and boys didn't want boys. She just didn't want a boy in her class. She thought, you know, cooking was for girls and boys should be doing metalwork and woodwork. And um, But then a new teacher had come along and she was a Miss Pope. She was about 20-something. A nice young teacher for yeah, you. Yeah, and she was really pretty and, you know, and of course, four of us <laughs> landed up in her, in her cooking class. Oh, right. It was before it had just been me. Three others had joined me now. But you knew you wanted to do it for I the knew cooking. I wanted to yeah, do it. See, you? I went to, uh, I took uh, my entrance exam for Hendon Tech Yeah. to do a city and guilds. You did thing. a two-year cookery course then. Yeah. And management. And we were yeah. talking that... When you look at the list of things that you needed, I mean, the list went on and on and oh, on, all Christ, the waiting yeah. stuff, all the waiters' uniforms, chefs, wives. Well, because it was a hotel and catering management course, we did, we, it, it, it was mostly cooking, but we did waiting on table as well. So we, And they had a restaurant at Hendon. On the top floor, they had the kitchens and the restaurant, and the restaurant wasn't open to the public, but it was open to guests so it was done properly and we all had to have all the gear the, all the waiting gear because right. we we did wait we cooked on monday and tuesday and we waited on table on a wednesday did you like the waiting on table i didn't mind it but i i didn't want to you know when you go to the chef they say yeah oh, you don't want to be a waiter so, and when you went to the waiter you said oh you don't want to be a chef and You'd what did a, you want to be i wanted to be a chef you still wanted to be a chef so i told him yeah but i enjoyed doing the waiting it was silver service then you know yeah. and we had the wing collars with with bow tie the jacket black jack tail jacket tail yeah and striped trousers almost like a maitre d in a you right. know, in a top hotel, and that and black shoes, all that to be bought. Yeah, um, and all your knives. I don't like knives, and just oh, I yeah. just remember Pete having all his knives. You know, no, we've got, got hunt, we got so many knives, and they're all. Sharp. I just think just manage with one. You only need <laughs> no, one to cut. Doesn't. No, he doesn't know. No. And the other thing you said was at school you got cane twice. Oh, there, the well, yeah. When we first when we first turned up at Hendon Tech, we uh, went in into the refectory to have because you could smoke. But you're in college now, so oh great, we can have a fag, you know. Teachers were there. What, Everybody smoked. We also yeah, I don't well I can't remember. Most of people smoked. Yeah. There might have been some who didn't. Oh, no, it, so we smoked. Really well, of course, you, the year then, before I got cane for smoking. Yeah. <laughs> Twice. Yeah. So. Um, and you know what? I didn't at my school. I didn't know one single person that smoked. It was a, a small girls' school. We went to comprehensive, mate. Oh, we don't go in there. Yeah, it's so different, <laughs> wasn't it? Yeah. It was a good school, though. It was, when you look back on Mount, Mount Grace, it was a it was a brilliant school. Brilliant. I think it still is pretty good. Yeah. But the, what you, you could do all sorts, you know, pottery, every, everything you could think That's of. Right. Had a big art class. The the um, woodwork was yeah. fully fully equipped. The the metalwork had the forge that you could learn how to do the forge and all that. Because I did it up until I to the fourth year. Fantastic. And um, well, and then they had two gyms, a girls' gym and a boys' gym. Um, so while you were at Hendon Tech, mm -hmm. for the two summers, yeah. you had to work, didn't you? Not two you? summers. One summer. One summer. Okay, you had to work. Yeah. And you went to the Isle of Wight. Yeah. So we'll, we'll uh, talk about Isle of Wight next time then. Yeah. See you later. Bye-bye. That's interesting, isn't it? For anyone uh, who's following along with the TA, Pete's rebellious child by default system. And so, you know, the teacher said, well, you're not coming in my class. And that didn't put him off because that's what he wanted to do. I, I jolly well am. So he went the next year. It was sad that he had to wait that extra year. But, um, yeah, he still did it. Whereas I was completely different at school. The teachers told me things 
and I believed them because I was in adapted child. I believe what that pet that parent or adult figure told me and that was their way of teaching then. Now, there weren't too many strokes handed out. You got told what was wrong but not necessarily what was right, what was good. Yeah, and I look back at those reports and you know there was quite a lot of good work. So when we talk about strokes and last week we talked about being kind to ourselves, that unit of recognition that, yeah, that being kind to ourselves, it's a good word, isn't it, stroking? How often we can stroke others, but how maybe we don't stroke ourselves. And when we think about self-doubt, what we need to do is stroke ourselves but we're not giving ourselves those strokes. We're not telling ourselves, like I've just told myself, your school report's okay. There's some very good bits in it. No, I, I wasn't told that. I was told about the bits that weren't in it. I didn't know how to self-stroke and say, well, I'm not doing too bad. I didn't know how to do that then. And of course, comparison is the thief of joy. I probably compared myself to the people, well, the teachers were doing that for me, weren't they? You know, you're fourth in the class, or you're sixth in the class. It was all very much, you all had to get either one, two, or three out of the whole lot. If we had a test, you had to become one, two, or three, or it didn't count. Well, it stands to reason, if there's a class of you, you can't all become one, two, or three, can you? You might have become 23, but still with a jolly good mark but we weren't stroked in that way. So what we need to do is accept strengths in ourselves. And constant reassurance doesn't mean much if we don't look at our strength, if we don't stroke ourselves, if we don't acknowledge what we've got. I mean, we don't have to go around doing this and doing that, do we? Oh, you know, it's not that kind of thing. It's about recognising our strengths, acknowledging them, yeah, self-stroking. Then when we want to reassure ourselves, we can draw on that. And that will help with any self-doubts that we've got. So positive strokes are good, but negative strokes are good too when you think about it. If we give children positive strokes the whole time, they don't learn. I mean, if we just say, you know, when they chuck their carrots on the floor, oh, never mind. No, we need to say, don't do that again. That's not kind. That's not nice. I've got to clear all that up. That's naughty. Please don't do that. Yeah, they've got to learn. Otherwise, they know that in themselves. And then what you're teaching them doesn't, it doesn't add up with what they know about themselves. They know that's not right. And if you say, oh, never mind, that's okay, then then they start, they really do become confused. Raising children on just positive strokes doesn't help. And it's the same for us. We need those negative strokes too. Negative conditionals, they can help flag things up. Or did you know that uh, your shirt's dirty? Oh, right, I didn't notice. Thank you, I'll change it. Without that negative conditional, we wouldn't be able to move on. It helps us. I can't stand you. Somebody says that. Well, it's positive in a way. It's a negative, unconditional. But we can use that as well because we can think, well, I'm going to withdraw from you. I'm not going to be your friend anymore. I'm going, yeah, we're going to look after ourselves. So we can use those negative, even negative unconditionals. And also what people often give out is the negative. You're late. They don't often say, oh, it's nice. I'm glad you're on time. It's really helpful. Yeah positive conditional. We don't give out too many of those, do we? And it's helpful if we do. So there's a little bit more about strokes and how they can help. How we can help ourselves by recognising our strengths 
And so we can draw when we re need reassurance. We can reassure ourselves if we recognize that. Don't compare yourself to others. That's the thief of joy. And so with those reassurances, we can stroke ourselves when we need that. So I'll leave it there. So we're going on now to the little film. I want to tell you a little bit about the film. I'm going to go and have a slurp because I've got a frog in my throat again. I'll see you in a minute. So the little film is just our usual walk that way and that way. And I just wanted to explain it because the first shot, there's the lighthouse and the sun was shining right on it. And it really made me think, last week I told you, Wilkie Collins looked at that lighthouse and said, ah, there's... What did he say? You are as still and weird as my white woman, the woman in white. By Jove, I've got it. And when I, so I took the, because it was just there, gleaming, but of course we've got windmills now. They're right out at sea. But just as the way the sun was shining on those, yeah, we've got those standing out in white now. And there was a little bit of rain, puddles and... Uh, there were so many blackbirds. I mean, loads and loads and loads of blackbirds. I didn't manage to get those. I just got, and loads of starlings, but I just got, uh, caught a couple of crows. So the crows are there and the wagtails there, bathing, make, making the most of this lovely, calm, sunny day that we had. Came back home, had a cup of tea. It was beautiful. You know, he's a youngster, a lovely Jay. He's always here, but I just got him pootling around uh, and we put some sunflower seeds out he liked those they've all gone now off to town and I show you Dickens house and Dickens said that he loved the bleak Isle of Thanet because it's quiet and I can think and dream here like a giant that's a nice thing to say isn't it he loved it it was said that he was in Italy having a great time, but he was pining for Broadstairs. It was a place he loved. And so there's Albion Hotel, uh, where he finished Nicholas Nickleby. And part of the hotel now is a house that he uh, used to live in. Uh, it's all incorporated. But you'll see the Albion Hotel, and you'll see um, Dickens' house, and... Bleak House. There's a shot of the bay with the sand piled up because we're ready for winter now. Usually they pile it much higher so you can't walk on it but I, I'm wondering if they're going to put more on it or if they haven't piled it quite so high because what all the children do is just run up and down it and it all falls down anyway. But it's there just as a little protection. And in Bleak House um, Hans Christian Andersen and Wilkie Collins were invited there as guests. It was called Fort House, but then Dickens finished Bleak House there, and so the name was changed in the early 1900s. Now, in Dickens' house, uh, David Copperfield's aunt, Betsy Trotwood, that's where she lived. Well, of course, she's a made-up character, but in reality, she was taken from... Miss Mary Pearson Strong and uh, she was Betsy Trotford, Trotwood personified and just opposite that house uh, is still a little bit of garden where uh, Betsy Trotwood waged war on the donkeys on the strip of grass in front of her house and um, that's what uh, Miss Pearson did Miss Mary Pearson Strong that's what she did and Dickens actually in the book set it in Dover because he didn't want to embarrass her but it was her and her little piece of of uh, garden and she used to you know go on about the donkeys so I'll show you that and it said in in the book that uh, that Broadstairs skyline is pretty much the same as Dickens would have seen it And in 1937, the resident of Dickens' house, she promoted the idea of people walking around the town in authentic 
Victorian Dickensian clothes and that then became Dickens Festival and it's been held every year since. I think it's just one year in the war it wasn't held but um, yeah we have Dickens Festival where people uh, in, you know they belong to the to the group and they walk around in the exact proper costumes and it's rather nice so that's the little film I'll see you next week and we'll see what next week brings I hope you have a good one thanks for joining me and uh, yeah I'll see you again bye The different aren't you yeah. completely the different Complete completely opposite. different opposite and so you knew age 13 well, probably a bit older than that a bit older me yeah, but that's what we worked out yeah roughly about there yeah yeah i wanted to be a cook so a you chef. knew quite young that you wanted to be a chef a chef mm, yeah and to doing that, that. Yeah. and and so this was 1958. You're talking about, yeah, something uh, like that. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. And you, well, I, I, yeah, well, the first year was a bit of a laugh. We just had a laugh the first year because we found out the one five zero, one five zero. You could still take the one five one if you failed the one five zero, and the one five one was, but yeah, you know, it, it included like it was one five zero as well. But you didn't have to take the 150 again. If you got the 151, 
you were that's it. You you had the one five one, and which is the most important one. So mm. we all mucked about the first. Then, yeah. And uh, we've done a ne- little episode, a little chat about Daredevil Lairs. Yeah, all and right, yeah. Uh, yeah. so we'll tell you a bit more about his Isle of White capers next time. Yeah. I think there was something we wanted to talk about about Hendon as well. So you're going to say goodbye? Oh, oh, the other thing was, it was smoking. Oh, yes, the other thing was, farthings were still in existence oh, yeah. when when we when I first went, but they were being taken out. They were going to be um, obsolete. Obsolete. They, you know, um, four farthings to a penny. Yeah. And we went into the accounts class, and the first thing the, the Nice little woman she was, she was taking the accounts. First thing she said was, well, we've got our books show farthings, but we won't be mucking about with farthings anymore. She said, because they're going to be obsolete in a, in a couple of months, so we can forget all that. Oh, you know, and then again, back at Mount Grace, we had to do everything, you know, adding up three farthings and you know, percentages and all farthings, oh, crumbs, you know. And they're, they're no longer legal tender and... Yeah, that was out the window. So there was a couple of things which was completely different. Yeah. What was good? Yeah. And I look back at those reports and, you know, there was quite a lot of good work. Now, what did you want for... I've got to start again now. No, you haven't. You, well, you can just... Surely you can just carry on. You said if I wasn't, didn't have my dressing gown. Oh, you? I see. Right. Okay. Um, I know we said Swede and something else. Two things. What was it? Peas. Swede what? and peas. Swede, peas and... You said courgettes. courgettes. Or I've got broccoli. We could put some cheese on the broccoli. Lovely. Do that then. Okay. Thank you, darling. Broccoli and... You see, I'll have to cut that bit out, won't I? You can see. <laughs> anyway, I see, I notice it's still running. I thought I'd stopped it. Well, maybe I have. I'll have to see it when it, at the end. I'll have to see what happens. So now I've lost my train of thought. But, you know, he's cooking me lunch, so I can't really moan, can I? But I did say, please don't come in. <laughs> there we are. So... When we talk about strokes, 